Sure. Uh, this is the first time I worked with Hélène Louvar, who is a fantastic cinematographer. And uh, she's not Brazilian, she's French. She doesn't speak Portuguese. And I thought it was actually quite interesting to have a, a woman cinematographer for this project. I thought it was very important, but also I thought it was important to have somebody who was not from Brazil, but actually, you know, um, took on the experience of being there for the first time, you know, and how to translate that on the screen. So there was an element of discovery, I think, that was very much uh, throughout the work very important. But it was also the first time I shot digital in my life. I've always shot, I'm an old guy, so I always shot celluloid. And the question also was how to translate in digital, you know, the, the vibrancy of those of those spaces, of, of, of the jungle that's very much in the heart of Rio. So we did a lot of research, you know, because we didn't also want the film to look like f film because it's, you know, it's... So we did a lot of research to understand, you know, how to capture that. And a lot of that was actually done before the film. We didn't do, I mean, we did a lot of color correction, but not to bring anything, but just to fix a few things here and there. So it was something that we thought a lot about before. And I think there's a really the big wish to make, you know, an artificial environment. You know, this is really... It's not only a period film, but it's a film about, you know, a lot of artificiality and a lot of things that are not said. So I thought it was very important to also bring that up, you know, as an element for the story. And we used also, um, it was very important to me that this film was not high definition, that there is some mystery to the image, that I think it is the dialogue with celluloid in a way. I shot a lot of Super 8 when I was beginning to make films. I still shoot a lot of Super 8. And there's something about the mystery that you have when you don't have high definition. So we also used, now this is very technical talk, but we used, I was very much looking, researching to old lenses, but old lenses that were not fixed or rehoused, you know, so that's also an element that we did together. So she was this great partner, not only on the set, but also on the research that we did uh, before we started, and then we thought of making the film. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, very good question, Ira. Thank you. Uh, no, it's a great question because it's actually the first film. This is my seventh film, I think, or sixth film. And uh, I've always had a very sort of conflicted relationship with narrative and storytelling in general. It's also seemed somebody, something very potent, but also always seemed like a straight jacket to me. And I was always much more interested in character. But on this film, I really wanted the challenge to do something a bit more classical. And melodrama is like a genre that I've always dreamed of working, but also I thought it was important to do it now politically, because I think it's really incredible how melodrama can translate you know, a political environment in a way which is not frontal, but it's you know, through, your ve you know, through your heart, through your tripes. So, but how do you do that? You know, how do you do that in a country where you see melodrama, you know, eight hours a day on soap operas, you know, how do you do that in a country where that genre has been so much washed down, washed out, and also how do you, how do you use that genre today, you know, so it doesn't seem like you're quoting something, but actually, you know, it's how you're actually taking the codes and bringing it to, to the days we live in. So it was, it was an interesting challenge, first of all, to work within the parameters of classical narrative, also to work with the parameters of there's a lot of time jumps in the film, you know, so how do you do that within a classical framework? So that was something that was very much on my mind. But I think beyond all of that, I think what was really interesting is how do you make this accessible to a contemporary audience, you know? And so I think there was some things that I started to think about, which is the question of the female body, the question of how do you represent violence through melodrama and not only conflict, but conflict expressed in the form of violence. How do you, you know, because a lot of when you think of, of course there are a lot of exceptions, but when you think of classical family melodrama, um, most of the work that I was referencing to was made in a time where it was, you know, there was something very Puritan about what you could show on the screen. So that was one element. How do you also make melodrama and how do you appropriate melodrama to make it something that it's specific to a certain place, you know? So the colors that you mentioned there, the sweat was very important, you know, and also um, a certain freedom because I think it's a genre that also can be very stiff. So how do you make it 
imprecise in a certain way, you know? How do you play with it and have fun playing with it in a way that... You know, the question that I was also asking myself is, can melodrama in be of interest of a, for a young audience? Like, how do you negotiate you know, dialoguing with a younger audience. So it was, it was, it was fun. You know, it was, it was, um, it was fun because I think the codes were there. So how do you appropriate those codes? You know, to to make that operation. But it was fun to tell a story. <laughs> yes. Any last questions? Yes, yeah, somebody here. Yes. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I think I can answer this. I would do the short answer, I'll do the long answer. So the question was about, um, at the beginning he mentioned how um, he had a lot of, he was raised by uh, several important women in his life, and so it has to do for him to elaborate a little bit more about that in respects to the film. Yeah, sure. I think the short answer is like, perhaps I'm Chico, you know, the son of Gida in a certain way, but the long answer is, uh, yes, the first time, I mean, I. Filmmaking was not really in my horizon when I was growing up, and the first film I've ever done was actually not supposed to be a film in the beginning. It was sort of an archive I wanted to do with my grandmother, who, who was at the time, she was 80 years old, and she died with 108, you know? So when she was 80, I thought I got to record this woman because she's so fantastic. Really, I mean, uh, I come from a lineage where my grandmother had two kids, so the two sisters are there, so my mother has one sister. and. Uh, she, her husband left her when she was like 23 or something like that in the 30s. So she could never get a job, for example, outside of the house because she was, there was no divorce at the time, obviously, but so she became a seamstress. So that first film is really about how she somehow raised her family working in the environment, you know, the domestic environment, but actually being a professional. And then, um, and then it's very much also the story of my mother, you know, the story of Gida. There's a lot of similarities. So that's when I also, when I read the book, it really hit the chord on me. And I think that's also a question that you, you ask yourself when you're making a film, you know. It is very personal, but it cannot be only personal. And I think what I did with that documentary, which was made in 1991, uh, was a documentary. And, and, and this is, you know, a fiction, but it's very much inspired, you know, by those women. And it was, in that documentary, it's actually about my grandmother, and she had four sisters. So I was the kid sort of navigating, I was not really a kid, I was 20 something, but you know, they told me a lot of gossips about themselves, you know, and that was the, the fabric of the film. And I hear when you ask about the book, um, I was really struck by it when, when Rodrigo, the producer, said, you're gonna read this, you're gonna, it's gonna interest you. So, you know, there's a lot of things that were there. And I think when you ask about adaptation as well, of course, there are a lot of things that were not in the book. There's a lot of lines that are in the film that actually, these are lines that I grew up with. There's one that didn't make into the film, which it, my grandmother used to say, when you escape a man, you, you can live a hundred more years, you know? But that is, they're not making into the film. Yes, up there? Yeah. Yep. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So, so were the letters yeah. kept by his sure, yes. husband? Listen, how do I answer this? Um, there was a whole scene in this film which is basically the letters were kept by the father, you know? And then I did a whole scene where actually I explained how the husband gets the letter from Gida and gives to the father. You know, it just became really complicated. And I think it's a really good question because for me, these letters were hidden from her, from this man, you know, from the father, from the grandfather. You know, clearly it could be the husband, I mean, the way that it's done now, you know, it's, I imagine that the father got the letters and then he gave it to the, to the brother-in-law, 
to the son-in-law to to keep them. And uh, it was a question I had, but you know, this is how I sort of resolved. I think it's an accumulation of cruel acts that are done in a way which don't seem so cruel. And I thought it was important that that was done, you know, from man to man on the family. But there was a scene that was seven minutes long where he goes. Anyway, let's not talk about this. But you know, it didn't make it didn't it didn't seem to it it didn't seem necessary because. I think at the moment that you actually know precisely who is giving back the letters, there's a, you know, you villainize a character that it's villainized enough, maybe, and so, and I think it's not only about the fact of hiding the letters, but there's so much more that was at stake. Okay, last question, right here, yeah. Sure, yeah. Yeah. So, so the question is about the two leading actors in the film. There were... I did a lot of auditions. I think the trouble with making a film in Brazil today with actors of that age is that a lot of them are doing TV and I was trying to avoid people that were doing too much TV. I think that the way they, there's a lack of mystery to that. You know, they're every day in your house, you know, on television. So I did, I think about 2000 auditions to get to these girls and uh, Funny enough, uh, Eurydice had done one soap opera, but you know she had done a really incredible role, and her audition was, in, you know, just unbelievable. And uh, so I just did a lot of a lot of auditions uh, to get to them. And also, we, I think we worked about two months before the film began shooting on rehearsals, but not rehearsals of the scenes, but actually rehearsals where they were together all the time for two months. You know, so when we started shooting, they were in the set together maybe for three days. So. And it's the, their first film, it's the first time they, they make, it's the first, the first film that they've made, you know. Julia Stockler, who plays Gida, she teaches theater, she's the daughter of a theater critic, she's an amazing actress, and I don't know why she hadn't done a major role, but her audition was breathtaking. And, uh, and Eurydice actually, it's interesting to talk about where she comes from. She comes from the outskirts of Sao Paulo. She went to drama school, she comes from a very working class family. And I think she is also, you know, she is a portrait of how Brazil has actually changed so much. Her access to acting was something that could not have happened 20 years ago. Yeah, so it was a lot of um, searching. Well, thank you, Karim, for... She has one more oh, question. One more question, okay. <laughs> Encore, sure. no. <laughs> <laughs> I did the same. No, 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 no. I think I was from the 50s. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Karim. Thank you. Thank you.